think it was mine. All right, is everybody here? Cool. Yeah. Uh, I will open room in about a minute. All right, here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna open this up. I'll give people about a minute to filter in and then get us started. Hi there. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a minute. Give people a couple seconds to filter in here. All right, I'm gonna get us going. Hello, I'm Erin McGurl, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's event, Rare Book Collecting in Black Francophone Caribbean Literature. I wanna start us off with a land acknowledgement. The BSA's office is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape in Brooklyn, New York. And today I'm speaking to you from the ancestral homelands of the Six Iroquois Nations Confederacy in a place today called Saranac Lake, New York. I invite you to read the BSA's land acknowledgement on our website if you're interested. And if you also want to share a land acknowledgement about um, where you are coming in from today, please feel welcome to do that in the chat. Uh, I also want to remind you about the events code of conduct. I'm going to put a link to the chat in there now. This is a community space. We are welcoming all the wonderful things that come with intellectual life. And these are our ground rules for how we create the community space where that's possible. So thanks for, for abiding by them in joining us today. Uh, this event is closed captioned by a live captioner in English, and I'd like to thank our captioner today for their work in making this event accessible. You can turn the captions on in the main control panel on your screen. And before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the format today for today's event. There will be two 15 minute presentations, followed by a really nice, generous question and answer period. So to submit a question to our speakers, please enter it into the Q&A box. All attendees can see, comment on, and upvote questions. And we ask you to do this to help us prioritize uh, sorry, I'm at home with my family and my dad is loud. Um, hey, can you please be quiet? Anyway, thanks, uh, dad. We encourage you to engage in conversation using Zoom's chat feature during the talk. But if you submit a question using the chat, I'll ask you to re-enter it in the Q&A box. 
So before, uh, so now I'd like to hand the event over to our presenters today. They are Kali Warren, Assistant Professor of Special Collections and Special Collections Librarian at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and Dr. Curtis Small Jr., Manager of Research Services, Special Collections and Museums at the University of Delaware Library Museums and Press. So without further ado, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I'm very excited about this conversation, uh, discussion, uh, presentations, whatever you want to call it, uh, between Curtis and myself. Um, I have been wanting to work with Curtis ever since I met him in 2019 at a conference he co-organized called Black Bibliographia at the University of Delaware. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it, and I'm going to pose this question, and we're going to follow this format for the both of us. So, uh, Curtis, let's get started. Uh, what sparked your interest in this collecting area, and why? Thank you, Kali. Uh, I briefly want to say I'm very happy to work with Kali as well. Uh, glad that she, that she invited me to do this. Um, and I am a librarian too, that, that I didn't tell Aaron to say that. <laughs> but uh, I want to um, first talk a little bit in a general way about uh, the importance of Black, uh, black Francophone writing, writer, writing in French by Black writers uh, as a collection area and more generally. Uh, in the US, works of Black writers in French have been seen uh, as more important during certain periods and with others than other periods. The Harlem Renaissance would be one example for, uh, for example, when, when certain translations were important. I think that these works originally written in French are certainly an important part of world literature. And hopefully today you will see how some of the themes and controversies that the books respond to are still relevant, particularly in terms of censorship, for example. A comprehensive accounting of Black bibliography should certainly include these works. I'm going to focus more on the collecting aspect. So I'll continue now with the my, my part of the talk. Um, can we go to the next slide? So <clears throat> I'm talking today in terms of, of a collection I've been building. It's still a small collection focused on Black writers in French. Uh, what sparked my interest, however, in, in this as a collecting area was that I developed an interest in Black literature in French, Black writers in French, uh, while I was an undergraduate at Temple University, a French major. I uh, eventually got a PhD on a related topic, the Haitian Revolution in literature in French that uh, included Black writers, though not, not all Black writers in my dissertation, but this was this became an interest of mine. However, uh, the notion of rare books or collecting was not a part, wasn't on my radar screen. When I was a graduate student, when I was writing my dissertation, I used a rare book room once, I remember, at the University of Pennsylvania for an obscure book I was using for my dissertation that came out of Haiti after independence. Uh, I do remember the first collector I met this was sort of a milestone, meeting somebody who collected. She was a graduate student uh, specializing in African-American literature at the University of Massachusetts, where I was working and teaching at the time. She told me she had started collecting and she was collecting, I remember, Toni Morrison, every book Toni Morrison edited when she worked at Random House, including the Black Book. And she told me that one of the faculty at UMass had a first edition of Ralph Ellison's novel, Invisible Man, which uh, blew my mind that somebody I knew would have that. I had never thought about that. I, I never forgot that. After I became a librarian in special collections, which I didn't know I was going to end up in special collections, although I enjoyed it, you know, I started going to book fairs as a part of my work, still not collecting for myself. At first, not even collecting for where I work, but uh, I eventually started. And I had an experience at the New York Book Fair that really made me think more seriously about collecting. And you will see here, 
you can see here this book that I encountered at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair in, in 2018. I took a picture with my phone, still have it. I didn't acquire this book, okay. Uh, this is a copy, though, of the Notebook of Return to the Native Land, one of the early printed editions of this very important book-length poem by Amy Césaire, presentation copy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a few details about the Cahier or the Notebook of a Return to the Native Land. It is a book-length uh, poem that was first published in 1947. Uh, it would be a key text in what would come to be known as the Negritude Movement. The Negritude Movement was a literary movement focused on issues of Black identity and politics as a response to French colonialism. The movement developed during the 1930s, 1940s, and led up to the period of independence for African uh, countries that had been under African colonial control, led up to and sort of prepared independence. Um, the movement was sparked, we, we believe, by students coming together from these various French territories and colonies in Paris, studying together, creating networks and creating a literary movement that responded to colonialism. But the Cahier is the first text to use the word negritude. Negritude, which is a, a neologism, refers to a certain type of Black identity in the poem, a certain type of Black identity or being which emerges in the course of this poem through struggle, emerges by the end of the poem. Uh, the first edition, first printed edition of the Cahier contained a laudatory essay by the French surrealist poet, André Breton. The name of that essay was A Great Black poet, un grand poet noir. And you see here a presentation copy uh, that contains that essay and the cahier. Uh, Breton, André Breton, very well known as a French realist writer, met Césaire in Martinique when Breton and other French intellectuals were fleeing the fascist Vichy regime that was in control in France. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But a, a, an affinity, literary and otherwise, developed between Césaire and those in his circle in Martinique and uh, Breton. Césaire's poetic style was very much influenced in part by French literary practices of the 19th century and surrealism. He said he was doing a sort of surrealism without realizing until up until he met Breton. This particular edition that you see here contains that preface, Un Grand Poète Noir, by Breton, and it's a presentation copy of Césaire to Breton. So you may imagine, after knowing this story and this literary history, when I encountered this at the New York Book Fair, I was, I was, really, I, I would, I was really shook. <laughs> and the price was quite high, not something that I would, you know, I wasn't collecting for myself anyway, and I certainly wasn't gonna try to collect this for our collection, but I never forgot it. Um, I just say in passing, this is not the first published edition of this text. Uh, the Cahier has, has a, a very complex publication history that has been laid out by scholars such as Alex Gill and others. Next slide, please. So that was a landmark event. Uh, I'll briefly read a somewhat unfortunate translation I did of the inscription because it doesn't translate well. Uh, However, as you see here, it reads, when a people passes its head through the cradle of the event, like a child through the shutters of the mother's sex, the eye of the basilisk and the mirror of the magician do not lose their rights. So I'm not going to unpack any of this. It's a very Caesarian. I don't, it does not appear in the Kai itself, but to find a presentation copy, of a poem, not just an inscription, but a poem by Césaire to Breton, who wrote this famous essay, which helped to spread knowledge about this text. You know, it blew my mind. So um, I did not collect it, however. Next slide, please. Now, before I talk about this slide, I'll say that once I did start to collect things gradually in this area, my, my collecting preferences are flexible, but 
in ascending order they are. I'm interested in first editions of books by these writers. Uh, and then more significantly signed editions, firsts or otherwise when I can find them. And then most meaningfully presentation copies with meaningful inscriptions. So the one you just saw is as, as meaningful as they get. And I'm not able to collect at this level, but I try to do something similar at a level that I'm able to handle, right? So this is one of the first things that you see here that I collected in this area. This is uh, the anthology of new Negro and Mal Malagasy poesy, poetry, Anthologie de la Nouvelle Poésie Negra et Malgache from 1948. This book was a foundational text also of the Negritude movement. The whole movement ended up adopting the name of this term using the, the, the word from a needle, needle, neologism from Cezier's poem, Negritude. This, this edition, this anthology was edited by Leopold Sédar Senghor, very famous black writer in French, who would go on to become later the president of independent Senegal. These were young writers at this time, right? Who would go on to become important writers and political leaders. This uh, edition of the book contains a famous essay by Jean-Paul Sartre called Black Orpheus or Orphe Noir that ended up being somewhat controversial. I'll say a little bit more about that later. This is not a first edition, but this is a presentation copy of a 1969 edition, the second edition, signed by uh, Songo, the anthologist and poet, to a French author named Michel de Saint-Pierre, not somebody I was really familiar with, but he was a popular author. And the inscription says that it's to introduce him to negritude, which is meaningful. I find it rather, kind of humorous in a way. Here's this famous anthology I wrote, you know, in, organized 30 years ago to introduce you to Negritude in 1969, if you don't know about it. So, um, um, you know, I think it's a great item. Next slide. Oh, I'll say, I'll say I have another, I, I quite another uh, uh, early edition of the Cahier, Césaire's Cahier that he similarly presented to a French politician on the left, because Césaire became a French politician in the Assemblée. He presented a, an edition of the Cahier and he inscribed it saying, this is to this gentleman, it to serve as sort of a key to Negritude and the Antilles. So they sort of have an educational function with giving these books to, to, to French people. Um, another item I collected, this I actually acquired for our collection at the University of Delaware. The, this is a, a significant investment more, more so, this particular one, but it's the most meaningful, I would say, important inscription uh, uh, presentation copy I have collected in this area. This is uh, a 1956 edition of Aimé Césaire's, Césaire's play, Et les chiens se taisaient, and the dogs were silent. So this was written after the cahier um, this, it was first published in 1956, but it was written during World War II, during that period of Vichy control in France and in Martinique, which was a French colony, which is still a part of France. Césaire used hermetic, rather uh, surrealist type language to evade the censorship of the French Vichy fascists. Uh, so this is where censorship comes up, still relevant. Um, but still in line with his project and those in his circle, like his wife, Suzanne Césaire, of promoting certain form of Black identity, right, and resistance to fascism and to colonial racism. Um, this particular book was first published in an earlier edition uh, uh, with a, as part of a work called Les Armes Miraculeuses, or Miraculous Weapons. This play was first published as a part of that poetry, poetry collection. And I do have a presentation copy of Miraculous Weapons as well, but it was published independently here as a play in 1956. And this inscription is to Jean-Paul Sartre. As I mentioned earlier, Sartre did an analysis of the Negritude movement, Black Orpheus, for that anthology, right? Now, Sartre's essay, Black Orpheus, that I said was controversial, it preceded that anthology. It was most famously criticized by the Martinique and revolutionary thinker, Franz Fanon. 
in his book, Black Skin, White Masks. And this was on account of the ambivalent attitude that Southwood took toward race in negritude. I would say that Southwood wrote a very astute analysis of the literary writing in the anthology. He took it very seriously, but he concluded that race as a category would cease to be important when a classless society came into being. This was back in the 40s. So he was writing within a Marxist frame, right? Fanon had been a student of Aimé Césaire's in Martinique and, and Fanon rightfully in Black Skin, White Mask, he rightfully credits Césaire with being at the forefront of emphasizing the importance of Black cultural identity, Blackness or negritude in Caribbean literary and cultural discourse. So we may forget that it was, it was a radical proposition to say that a Martinican could be Black of African descent, and then that was a good thing and a source of inspiration, radical, right? Sato's attitude was somewhat different. He called it an anti-racist racism in a sort of a Hegelian sort of term as part of a dialectic. But in any event, um, Fanon's critique notwithstanding, this inscription that you see here by Césaire attributes important to Sato's essay. He writes to Jean-Paul Sartre, whose analysis of the negritude movement forcefully served to light the way. That's a translation of the French. So I think that's a pretty meaningful trans, uh, inscription, right? It's not a poem, but it's, it's, I think that these inscriptions in these presentation copies should, should form a part of the bibliographic record, right? They are part of, they are paratexts, and I think they need to be accounted for in bibliographic projects. <clears throat> Next slide, I'll move on. I think I made my point, hopefully, about why we would want to collect these. But I'll very briefly, I'll probably have to leave out institutional collecting, Kelly. Maybe I'll get that in later, Kelly. But uh, one, I don't want to leave the women out, OK? Because women did not appear in the anthologies, right? Or much of anywhere else during the first years, in the years of the narrative movement. But the uh, women's perspectives, when they arrived on the scene, are extremely important. Right. And in this particular case, we're looking at a Haitian writer, Marie Chauvet. This is one of the most important books in the history of Haitian literature. I've collected a first edition, not inscribed. I'd be shocked to find a described or presentation copy or signed copy of this. Marie uh, Vieux Chauvet was a Haitian writer who published these, uh, Amour, Colère, Folie, uh, Love, Anger, and Madness, as three novellas in 1968 in France, Gallimard. But the novel was suppressed because of the way, critical way it represented the Duvalier regime, the dictatorship of Francois Duvalier. She had to go into hiding. She had to go into exile. And the copies of this book were suppressed. The story has it that her family bought up all the copies they could in Port-au-Prince because, number one, they were a bourgeois family. They weren't happy with her being a writer anyway. And the novel was extremely dangerous. And I've read that she died in poverty in New York. I'm not sure about that. Maybe. Uh, but she definitely went to exile. This is an important first edition of the sort that I that I that I that I collect, and I will I will end there because I'm at 15 minutes or maybe a little beyond, and I will pass. I hope I've justified or showed at least what's interesting about this. We don't have a lot of an, a large institutional collection where I work, so this collecting is somewhat a labor of love for me. But I will pass now to Kali. Okay, thank you, Curtis. Um, always very fascinating, interesting um, slide. We'll just start with the next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm presenting the question to myself, what you know, sort of sparked my interest in this uh, area of literature, the subject area of literature. So I'm gonna look at my notes because it's a very long story. <laughs> Um, I was, uh, I, I told Curtis that um, in high school I took French um, and eventually found out uh, through taking French in college, it's probably not the best way to, to learn languages. Um, but anyway, um, I ended up being a non-traditional student in around 2009 um, and transferred into University of Illinois Chicago in around 2011 and was required to take a language. Uh, I tried to get out of taking French again by trying to take Spanish, but all the Spanish uh, courses were booked up. So ended up back in French again. 
Um, and I was also a member of the Honors College. I was a student in the Honors College. So Honors College students usually have to do um, extracurricular activities and they are assigned a fellow, which is usually um, uh, a more experienced uh, professor with a specific project or some long-term project that you can work on. So anyway, I met my fellow after going through two uh, fellows. I met my fellow uh, because she posted a request for students uh, to work with her on curating an exhibit and also hosting a symposium in 2012. Uh, this professor's name is Nancy Cirillo. And um, this wasn't her first sort of experience with the materials that existed in UIC Special Collections. So 2012 to 2013, um, she created this exhibit that included the Sierra Leone collection, which is mainly Anglophone manuscript materials, the anti-slavery pamphlet collection, which is in rare books, and that includes in fra a fragmentary collection of Sandeming Haiti government pamphlets and documents in French, um, the H.D. Carberry collection of Caribbean studies. H.D. Uh, Carberry was a Jamaican lawyer and poet. Uh, the collection is composed of Black Anglophone and Francophone literature in English. And then also the Buslick Caribbean book collection which is a 20th uh, and 21st century history book collection um, that is composed of literature and travel books. So getting back to some of my uh, attraction to the subject area, I had also been exposed to the Antiguan American writer Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place, which started me thinking critically about the Black diaspora and the different experiences or the distinct oppressions of Black people in other geographic locations. Anyway, UIC Special Collections, um, as I mentioned, I was exposed to the Anti-Slavery Pamphlet Collection, the H.D. Carberry Caribbean Studies Collection, and the Buslick Caribbean Book Collection. I continued to do research in Caribbean studies in library school and came across blank, Black Francophone thinkers and writers such as Edward Glisson, Maurice Condé, Amy Cesar, Edwidge Dandicat, and more. Uh, in 2018, I inherited the responsibility for the collection development in rare books. I was introduced to the subject area in a general sense through the mixed Black Francophone and Anglophone collection, as I mentioned, the H.D. Carberry collection. Um, and the Buslick donors were, uh, uh, they are a married couple. They're still alive, um, older faculty member. Uh, and he, he's a faculty member in English, sorry. I'm getting a little distracted here. Um, the Buslick Rare Book Collection, I already described it, sorry. Um, these volumes, sort of highlight the intellectual, cultural, and artistic productions of peoples who were transplanted and colonized by European and North American countries. And some of the volumes were published in the Caribbean, the United States, and other parts of Europe. So next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit of background. We're gonna sort of zoom out of personal collecting into institutional collecting. So. The H.D. Carberry Caribbean Studies Collection was acquired in 1997 at the request of a group of humanities faculty. So that included Professor Nancy Cirillo. Um, there was this plan to develop a Caribbean studies curriculum around issues related to post-colonialism and the diaspora, the Black diaspora specifically. Um, it was also this idea that it would complement collections at other institutions, such as Northwestern's Africana Collection and University of Chicago's Southern Asia Collection. Uh, the collection is mostly composed of English language works, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it includes out of print and rare first edition volumes, and there are about a uh, thousand volumes. Next slide, please. So accessibility. So um, the main thing about this collection that 
I've found in sort of the documentation about the acquisition was that they were very concerned about um, mainly keeping this particular collection in its location in Jamaica uh, because of environmental conditions. Um, sometimes I'm of two minds about that, about uh, institutions in North America purchasing uh, collections from, um, you know, Caribbean locations with the sort of justification that they will not be safe in those locations. Uh, but anyway, so the accessibility question came up. So there's researchers, uh, you know, that would like to access these collections uh, on a global scale. Um, primary source collections for the research and study of the post-colonial Caribbean are not always held within the nations or regions in which they were created or whose cultures they represent. So there was a project that started um, that was about the digitization of the fragile book covers in the collection and mainly focused on the out of print books. So it's not every single book that was, uh, the cover was digitized, but a good deal, a good sample, probably about 340 books. So the university library decided to partner with the Digital Library of the Caribbean, so DLOC, which was founded in 2004, um, and the host university is University of Florida. Next slide, please. And one of the books that it, the book covers that has been digitized is by a Haitian poet, novelist, journalist, folklorist, and politician. Uh, Philippe Toby Marcelin, and he often co-wrote with his brother Pierre. So this book in particular, The Singing Turtle and Other Tales from Haiti, was meant for a younger audience. It is a collection of tales remembered from childhood. The translation, the English translation, was created by his wife, Eva. Um, and we also, too, I want to point out, um, I want to connect this idea to what Curtis was trying to say about women sort of being highlighted uh, in this sort of negritude movement is that women were, they were writing, uh, but they were also doing some of the administrative work uh, such as this, such as translation. So what's missing uh, from a lot of these translations and in this one in particular is uh, the gestures and songs that would have accompanied the telling of the stories. So there is um, a Library of Congress audio of Mr. Toby Marcelin reading from other poetry collections. I listened to it and it kind of broke me a little bit because he doesn't sound well. Um, and I think he actually interrupts himself and, and steps away for a moment and then comes back and finishes reading. But um, I don't know if, no, it's probably read only. So let me see if I can maybe listen to the audio a little bit. But I'm not sure if the audio is going to come over. Mille bambou grêle font à la sauce un rideau de chasteté où se prennent les rayons du soleil et la danse nuptiale des colibris. C'est le décor des idylles créoles, des manguiers, des fougères, de la mousse, le ciel léger des Antilles, et comme un essor de colombe, négresse votre blanc sourire. Les fleurs ont-elles des pensées Elles ont de jolis noms. Tandis que la mulatrice épanouit toute la sainte journée, elle est, elle est assise au balcon. Sa chair est douce, dorée, la chair des bananes, son ventre lisse et dur comme une bille de gaillac et la sève impatiente des flamboyants ou utile en vain sur ses lèvres. Seigneur, ah Seigneur, si seulement pour descendre jusqu'à nous, elle pouvait enfin se déprendre de regarder les passants. Tu fredonnais une méringue obscène et triste. J'ai tambouriné avec une émotion déchirante sur le fer d'Ili. Un arbre indiscret sur le sapon. So what I love about that 
audio and there's a little over 11 minutes of it, I will share it in the chat, um, is that you can hear him sort of turning the pages um, like I said, unfortunately, it's kind of sad because at a certain point you can tell that he wasn't well. So he steps away from the audio for a few minutes, but um, it is such a beautiful piece of history. And I'm very excited that the Library of Congress um, has this as part of their collection. Um, it is called, the collection is called the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape. Okay, and next slide, please. Okay, so institutional priorities. So when, you know, my, <laughs> um, Curtis is sort of the expert here, uh, deeply, ex you know, his expertise runs pretty deep with Black Francophone Caribbean literature. Um, in my professional capacity, I'm looking at sort of different elements. And we've had, we had a discussion about this when we were planning this talk. So um, he can fill in any of the blanks that I leave empty after I finish this part. But institutional priorities sort of shape um, how we collect and what subjects we collect in. So first we think of institutional priorities that are associated with this sort of institutional assets. So that could be in a specific context. So I'm working for a public uh, university that is part of a university system. We have three uh, universities within the system and we are located in the city of Chicago. So uh, we are what I have termed an under-resourced institution and there are a variety of reasons why that is. Um, our flagship location is better resourced than we are. Um, so that sort of influences like and shapes um, the subject areas that I can focus on. Uh, a concern of mine, which I've mentioned at other uh, talks is preservation and conservation. Um, also institutional priorities include uh, faculty needs and, and students needs. So what I mentioned in the description, this sort of waxing and waning of popular public and or disciplinary discourse. So as I mentioned and gave you some background about um, the foundations of this particular collection of the H.D. Carberry collection, it was actually that they wanted these primary sources because they planned on having this sort of Caribbean studies curriculum. I'm not sure how successful that was. And Professor Cirillo is now long retired. Um, and so another issue it are the frequent changes in university administration. Um, so maybe like our last provost, um, uh, the special collections library was the sort of darling of her because uh, her father did research in uh, Atlantic slavery. So she kind of shielded us from a lot of things. Um, but now we, we, we don't have a provost, we have an interim person. Uh, we had a provost for I think about a year and then he decided to leave when we got a new chancellor uh, who just started in July. So then we also have at the college level, we have uh, changes of, of deans of colleges. So a complete change in priorities. So these are the types of things that sort of shape, even though I have a deep personal interest in Black Francophone Caribbean literature, and um, I would love to sort of um, continue to build up in those areas. Uh, I don't know, it, it ebbs and flows. Um, so maybe one year I'll be able to focus on it. And then the next year I won't, there won't be any funding. Maybe one year um, there will, a donor will come along and they will have donor directed funds. Um, and maybe I'll be able to use those funds. Uh, maybe there is an award because sometimes the flagship university, which is, uh, if you all don't know, which is Urbana-Champaign, um, sometimes they award uh, us money for specific areas of the collection. So for example, I was awarded a certain amount of money to build up uh, in letterpress and book arts, but it was very directed. 
So um, even though I was excited to make purchases from these letterpress and book artists, um, the money was just for these two individuals. Uh, but it allowed me to sort of uh, fulfill a fantasy of mine, which is uh, building this sort of counter narrative to some of the traditional, more traditional items that we have in the collection. So this is what I consider the, um, you know, this sort of area of Black Francophone Caribbean literature. Um, but I do look forward to, you know, building this out over time. I just don't know how realistic that is. Um, and lastly, I think I skipped the slide. I forgot a slide, but a most important thing is, no, I didn't, yay. Okay. <laughs> Um, see, this is more informal. Um, so in our collection development policy, we follow uh, the Library of Congress's research library group, group conspectus. Um, and the Black Francophone literature falls underneath this instructional support area. So they define it as a collection that is adequate to support undergraduate and most graduate instruction or sustained independent study. So those who are experienced in collection development in rare books, you should be quite familiar. This should be a part of your collection development policy. Um, if it isn't, then you know, snapshot, take a snapshot of this um, because this is quite helpful. So for example, we have um, our comprehensive uh, collecting area would be something like, um, I don't know if you all have heard of this person, but um, her name is Jane Adams. Um, she was a social settlement person. So we have a uh, whole house collection. So we sort of comprehensively collect in that area. We take all donations, we take, um, you know, we purchase materials. We want that collection to be as full um as possible about the lc thank you i did post a link in the chat um thank you aaron um but there are different levels and so you know black francophone literature falls under this sort of instructional support which is still quite important area of collection okay so i will just wrap my part up right there and we can open it up for questions or further discussion, anything that Curtis would like to fill in. Thank you so much, Kelly. I, I, I do wanna give us time for people. Maybe we, we looks like we have two questions, but I, I wanna briefly, not, not so much fill in. I, I'm so glad that you talked about the uh, aspect of institutional collecting and collection development policies that might focus on uh, instruction or, or, or uh, library instruction. You know, at the University of Delaware, this would be how I could justify collecting uh, Black Francophone literature. We're strong in literature, it's very strong in poetry, in English, Irish poetry. Um, Black Francophone literature is not a strong area. African American literature and poetry is strong. Black Francophone. We don't have a PhD in that area. A collection has been built in that area. And I have not yet managed to get faculty buy-in for the things that I have bought to get faculty to come and use it. Um, I'm still working on that in terms of outreach. So at this point, I can't justify, I really can't justify acquiring things for our collection that would be used for teaching if I don't yet have the faculty buy-in that I, where I know that they're going to be used uh, for teaching and, 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 and uh, curricular support, uh, number one. The other thing I'll say, um, well, I won't say anything else right there. I'll maybe talk a little bit more about other, other institutions, uh, the Schomburg and the Bloxen a little bit, but I wanna give our attendees a chance to ask their questions. So I'll, I'll hop in now to read some of those questions. I had a talk with my dad, uh, so he's not going to reappear on the scene. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to ask this question, the first question first, um, I think because I think it's fairly straightforward. And this is how do you search for these books? And can you name 
um, any worthwhile vendors or sites are, are I'm, I'm especially curious to know if there are booksellers in the antiquarian book trade who are specializing and doing interesting work, um, pick, finding stuff in this area. Um, yeah, I'll preface that by saying that one of the reasons, preface my response to that good question, one of the reasons I didn't start Besides price, you know, uh, one of the reasons I didn't start collecting this earlier was was because of not seeing it, not seeing these books in places I went where books were for sale. For example, going to the rare book school classes I took, you know, they have a collector's night or uh, we, we, uh, a buyer's night, right? Vendors night, whatever they call it. Thursday night where you go to the booksellers in Charlottesville and you can look for books. So, you know, I was new to the profession. I didn't see books by Black Francophone writers. I didn't see a lot of books, bookseller night. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, I'll, you know, I did buy one thing, though. I did make my first uh, purchase there, which was um, a copy of a really important translation that happened in the 20s, a novel called Batwala that was translated and it was really important for the uh the uh the Harlem, Harlem, Harlem Renaissance uh, writers I found an English trans the first English translation that I did buy it and not knowing what I was doing at that time spilled the drop of water on the bindings so it got a little stain <laughs> but anyway um now I I did see that book the first uh presentation copy I showed was from the New York Book Fair Right. I didn't buy that. It was quite expensive. I hate this gentleman took it back to France. I don't think I, last time I asked him, he had not sold it. But um, I do see some things at the New York Book Fair. You know, at, at that instance, at that place, you know, at that gathering, you know, the prices are going to tend toward the high side. I have bought some things there. Uh, I would say rather than getting into individual vendors, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, uh, I'm being, but there's one called Le Feu Follet in Paris, where I had a lot of good dealings with. And I found their books and discovered them through ABE books. You know, if you do a search for some of these writers, some of these authors, you're going to find some things in ABBE, ABE books, biblio.com. You know, I've searched and bought things from. And, um, and the New York Book Fair, mostly, you never know what you're going to find. And what may not be important to somebody else, it may not even cost all that much money in the grand scheme of things. At, at like say one of the satellite fairs in New York, I bought a copy of a French version of one of Richard Wright's uh, sort of an, a kind of an anthropological thing I had never heard of before called uh, uh, Pagan Spain. You know, in France, published in France, he lived and wrote in, in, in France, but not in French. You know, I, I, I got it. it wasn't all that much money. So there's some serendipity too. And what I'm going to collect depends on what strikes me. You know, um, I don't have a comprehensive policy and I have to have every edition of the Kaya or anything else. So. You want to comment on that, Kali, or should I move on to the next question? Um, I. The thing is, is that, as I mentioned toward the end of what I was discussing, is that oftentimes it, because of where I work, um, it's what is presented to me. So oftentimes booksellers are aware of what your collecting focus is. They know what collections that you have. And if something, someone emails me directly about a book um, that is in that subject area, I am definitely taking a look at whatever that item is or whatever that collection of, of items are. Um, that being said, yeah, after, you know, three years of COVID and all that kind of stuff, our, you know, funds and everything are limited. So I don't really, I try not to get myself excited about looking for things for the institution. I might look at things uh, for myself or personal collecting. And I really loved uh, in our series of conversations, uh, Curtis's approach, which is, you know, um, picking, selecting items that aren't necessarily super expensive, 
but that are fascinating, that are interesting, that um, that you you know sort of instantly love. Um, I love that approach uh, to personal collecting. So if there could be some sort of overlap, and if I was better funded, um, that would be fantastic. That's my addition to that question. So I'll move us along now to a question from Jose Guerrero. And he says, Dr. Small's discussion of the unfortunate translation of Césaire's presentation inscription to Breton reminds me of Edouard Glissant's conception of the right to opacity. Legibility might lend itself to certain forms of harm. And I think about this a lot in relation to bibliographic description, catalog records, et cetera. Do the presenters have any further thoughts on how opacity does or does not show up in your experiences with personal or institution, institutional collecting of rare materials? And in this case also, I think this is a great little addendum. What does rare even mean? Um, there seems to be some opacity around that term. So have at it. So Curtis, give we, we talked about that last part in one of our meetings. So I would love for you to tell Jose what you think about that. What does rare even mean? I'm going to start with that part. I think rare is a kind of unfortunate term uh, for an area of collecting, for an area of, of, of intellectual inquiry, a bibliographic injury. I think it's misleading. Um, you know, um, it's a commercial term. It's, it's a commercial term in some settings, right? I mean, like I said, when I was working on my dissertation, I had to open the rare book room in East Pennsylvania. I somebody from an underrepresented group and a first generation college student who's a public from Iowa and probably other public libraries, right? Uh, the rare book room just is on uh, a place. Uh, you know, I didn't know what it meant. But what I forgot, what I didn't realize was that places like the Schaumburg collection or the Buxton collection that I was introduced to an undergraduate school and visited, you could consider those to be rare book repositories, but you know, I don't I never thought of them that way. You know, uh, I thought of them as inclusive spaces where you go to learn about, you know, the history of black literature and art society. So I, I don't even want to use the word rare. You know, although uh, what can be literally be rare, I find. And also, I think I said to Kelly that, you know, the notion of rare books also in some ways is somewhat artificial because it's as if the books in such collections are intellectually continuous with what you have in circulating collection. They are, they're in the same catalog, you know, they're on the same topics, but you have to go to a special place to find them. We, we do want to conserve that. We want to break down the barriers that cause people maybe not to want to come just because of how the place is designed, for example. Uh, which can be kind of off-putting. And hopefully, you know, that is changing. Uh, not fast enough. That's my off the cuff answer to that. It's about rare. In terms of opacity, hi, uh, Jose. Uh, nice to hear from you. And I think that's a really important um, question. And I would say just, I mean, I, you know, I mean, this one's somebody that I have collected as well. Uh, um, started to collect. Uh, it's an important idea. It is impossible to translate cultural meanings, you know, in the context of colonialism completely and the right to capacity. I think it's a really important idea, the right to opacity. And I might try to apply that idea to what Cesar was doing during uh, the war, you know, using French, using a his innovation, I would say, within the French poetic tradition in the service of, of, of what you might call opacity, it would, it would not be, the meaning would not, not be accessible to all. And it also served in this instance, you know, to avoid censorship. Uh, and I, I just, reading, preparing for this, I've read another quote from Césaire where he makes a statement to that effect, not using the term opacity, but, you know, the right, uh, the idea that these cultural cultural information is not going to be fully understood because it's not completely translatable and colonial frame would not have access to these meanings in any event. But uh, now I'm gonna ask you, Eric, to reread the first part of, of, of Jose's question because I had that first sentence. Uh, 
So I think I'll read the second sentence because I think that's more where the question is rooted. Where he talks about the unfortunate translation. Yeah, he says, um, okay, so your discussion of the unfortunate translation of Césaire's presentation reminds Jose of Edouard Glissant's concept of the right to opacity. Legibility might lend itself to certain forms of harm. And I think about this a lot in relation to bibliographic description. So I think this is that question again about like about cataloging and what we, and this concept. Right, oh, so that was my unfortunate translation. So while opacity is an important idea, <laughs> you know, it's also related to, you know, my ability to translate something that is in, in a way so, so kind of complex and layered, so. Great question. Do you want to? Yeah. Great question. I'll just add something really quick. Um, because more mine is more attached to a story, and I think that it. Um, so just reading. So my personal experience. I'll share a personal experience, and then I will talk about um, a reading about uh, translation in general about uh, Maurice Conde. So when I was working on an article that had to do with special collections, archival instruction, and our fragmentary uh, Sandeming and Haiti materials, um, when I was going through the uh, revise and resubmit process, I used this sentence um, or this phrase that the editor did not understand. And I was kind of refusing to explain it <laughs> because, um, it was for a particular audience. And if that audience read the article, they would actually know what I was talking about. Um, and of course this was in English, it wasn't in a different language, but um, the editor really kind of demanded me and cornered me on you know, explaining what that is. And I think um, you know, for those who, uh, you know, speak a sort of uh, American, uh, African American vernacular English or a Creole or any sort of um, other variation of an official or sanctioned language that they're going to, uh, that demand is going to be demanded of them to sort of reveal uh, what they mean by that. So it is beautiful. This sort of right to opacity is beautiful. Uh, beautiful idea. And I was reading about Maurice Condé and how there was this sort of struggle with the different editions. So the translations, the different editions, um, how they were going to uh, print the title on the cover of the book, um, you know, where Maurice Condé really just wanted a simple title. Uh, and it was, uh, what is this book? Um, we were just talking about this, uh, Curtis and I. So uh, but she just wanted uh, moi to Cuba. That's all she wanted. But the editor and the publisher were pushing back on her and wanted more detail. And that had a lot to do with um, audience. It had a lot to do with market, like how they were going to sell books. So they had to place things on the cover that would be appealing to a broader audience. Um, but I'm all for the right to opacity, Jose, if that, uh, to put it simply. Um, I, I, one thing occurs to me uh, in terms of, of Black literature in French coming from the Caribbean, for example, uh, in line with, you know, the idea of meanings that aren't accessible, right, and that can't, shouldn't be. Uh, is the fact that within Black literature from the Caribbean, Les Antilles, the Antilles, like Martinique, Guadeloupe, Haiti, you have a linguistic layer, a substrate from the Creole languages, the various Creoles. And there's been some work on this. Uh, you know, when you're reading, you may be reading a paragraph in French uh, written by Marie Condé but you don't realize that th this, this, this phrase, this sentence that can appear like 
French, just French, also comes from a Creole proverb. They may have a different meaning. A lot of the, of, of the, the, the lexicon of Creole comes from French. So you can miss layers of meaning by not, if you don't know Creole, uh, for example. And I, I saw a translation of a copy of one of the short stories of Maurice Condé by a wonderful person, a uh, colleague uh, in the French department when I was at Smith College and she did a translation of two of Maurice, Con of, uh, Maurice Condé's brilliant short stories. And she translated it without realizing that the French title was from a, a Creole proverb. She, she didn't get it and she didn't know that when she translated the title and she didn't find out till Marie's Conde came and spoke at Smith and, that, and that's where she learned it. So, and even she had translated it. So, you know, it's fascinating. So we have one, one last question. Um, if it's, we'll go maybe five minutes over um, that uh, this question is from Kiara Melendez, and they ask, what drew you both to look into Black Francophone literature specifically based in the Caribbean rather than France or other European countries? Uh, was it the intersectionality inherently found in the production and contents of these works? Um, I will jump in there because I'm not like, I was fo I'm focused on it for the purposes of this, this, this talk. And I think Kali had that in mind, the Francophone Caribbean. I think that uh, I'm interested in collecting and have started a little bit collecting other black writers uh, from France. That's the stuff I, I, I would read and I would teach. France, black writers writing in France, as well as Africa. Uh, I just purchased, it hasn't arrived yet a copy of a novel in German, which I don't read, but um, a copy, uh, a signed copy uh, of a novel that was written in French from Senegal by the novelist and filmmaker uh, uh, Usman Samben, who I think is just one of the coolest people. Uh, he has passed away. And, um, you know, and then there's a whole story as to why that particular novel is, is of, and he, he's of interest to me from my earlier studies that I won't get into. But I'm not, I'm not interested in just about, you know, the Caribbean writers, uh, African writers, the women writers, like I said, Mariama Ba from Senegal. Uh, yeah. Right. And for me, it is about sort of the Black diaspora. It's not, you know, I, mean, I, I landed in this special collections library, like Curtis said, uh, maybe he didn't foresee uh, himself becoming a librarian. I did not foresee myself being at UIC, working with these collections that I worked with as a student. Um, so it's basically sort of proximity to the collections, proximity to, you know, being in the Americas, um, you know, having friends that were front, had a variety of different backgrounds. Um, I had a friend who was uh, half Jamaican. Um, so there's different personal experiences that sort of shape, um, you know, that overlap with your professional experiences. So it's not something that you set out, you know, to do, oh, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, specifically about Black Caribbean writers. Um, and then two, even that a part of the uh, negritude movement, which um, Curtis was sort of hinting around is that, you know, that not only involved, you know, all of these movements, we were all speaking to each other in sort of this call and response manner across the oceans. So, you know, across the Atlantic, you know, um, we were all speaking to each other, um, you know, through music, uh, intellectualism, um, you know, social cultural exchanges were happening. Um, they just were not happening in the way that they do now, which is social media and the internet. Uh, but we had our own internet. We had our own, um, what is the scholar? I forgot his name. I just taught him in the fall. Um, a common wind. Um, we, you know, black folks have a common wind. So I'm definitely interested in uh, black writers in different locations, uh, in different languages. 
Um, I read better in French than I speak it. I already told Curtis. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's my thinking about that and my response to that question. Great questions. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us and especially to thank Kali and Curtis for proposing this event to our events committee and uh, sharing their knowledge and their experience. Uh, I really got, I, I learned so much and really appreciate hearing about everyone's experience um, as collectors in both of these different contexts. So thank you so much. And thank you. this was wonderful. See you all again soon. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Thanks for coming. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.